Hey everybody, welcome to FoundFlix. Today we'll be venturing further into the universe of Crypt TV, examining some of the many monsters that inhabit their dark and horrifying corner of YouTube. They have a ton of new content coming out featuring a variety of creatures, but it's interesting as all of the shorts and series are considered part of a unified Crypt TV monster universe, or MCU, Monster Cinematic Universe. That's a Marvel joke. But similar to those big budget extravaganzas, all of Crypt TV's monsters exist in one unified universe. So far we've seen a few references to this via subtle easter eggs, such as the birch symbol dangling on a tree in Mordio, or Taylor's journal in Sunny Family Cult featuring drawings of both Mordio and the look -see. There's a ton of creatures in the universe already introduced, so let's dig deeper into a select few. What I think are the most terrifying and interesting, explaining what these monsters are all about, breaking down their characteristics, powers, and stories. The birch is what could be classified as a forest god, or even in a way, a physical manifestation of Mother Nature herself, as it is referred to several times as female. We first overhear a boy's mother telling of how people believe the forest cares only for itself, but she says that's not true, and that the forest can feel our pain as well saying that the birch will protect him after she is gone as it has protected her, handing over a book that appears to be made up completely of wood, filled with the symbol tied to the birch, which is how one seeks out the creature. We must assume that this book is very old and has been passed down through generations in this family, handing down the book and the knowledge of the birch over the years. His mother goes on to say that the birch protects children that it deems pure of heart. So to hopefully have the birch help him out against a bully, the boy searches the forest for the symbol as his mother described. The bully happens to find the kid in the woods and he tries to defend himself by holding up the stick symbol. But the boy scoffs, breaking the stick. He doesn't realize this, but breaking the stick appears to be how to get the creature summoned, as we learn of the notion that he who breaks me shall come undone. And as soon as the bully breaks the twig, the birch appears, looking very scary standing approximately eight feet tall, its skin appearing completely made of bark, almost as if it is disguised as a tree until summoned, with a twisted crown of roots on its head. The bully runs for it after seeing the creature, but doesn't stand a chance. Next scene torn up with some of his organs strung out on branches, the birch and the boy standing together holding hands. Now that he knows the rules of how to bring the birch to his aid, the creature is now his protector, continuing the family's tradition after his mother's passing. Part of the series Crypt Fables, the Kinderfonger is a quite spooky take on the story of the Pied Piper. The creature is a tall, specter-like figure wearing a black robe with a skeletal face. It's mainly seen using a flute-like instrument to put people under its spell, as with the Piper in the fable. However, the Kinderfonger's flute emits dark wisps of smoke that appear tied to the the creature's area of effect, which it uses specifically to take children, its name loosely translating to Child Snatcher. Our story opens with a missing poster being put up for Max, sister to deaf Jordan, who joins others in searching, Max being the latest in a string of children gone missing in the area. She catches a glimpse of her brother sitting nearby before wandering off alone, suddenly surrounded by the Kinderfonger's black smoke bringing her to a cave, on the other side discovering the missing children amongst a series of rocks placed in circles. The area surrounded by the creature's black smoke. It rises up into a cyclone, revealing the Kinderfonger playing his flute, keeping the children under its spell, as Jordan joins the children in the circle next to her brother. A fire erupts around the monster, Jordan's hearing aid squealing, which she drops, breaking the Kinderfonger's concentration by producing a loud noise, allowing them to escape back to the cave. The other kids are freed as well, and it looks to be a joyous reunion as they run out of the cave towards their worried parents. But the Kinderfonger obviously brainwash them into becoming his minions as they surprisingly attack the adults, tearing them to pieces in a scene of bloody mayhem. The siblings exit the cave shocked to see what's unfolding, and the Kinderfonger appears behind them yowling, implying they wind up victims of the monster as well. And it seems its entire purpose for taking the children is to take over their minds and become helpers on his behalf, spreading the killing to the outside world, and onto adults, which perhaps are immune to his song, since it only appears to take children. The thing in the apartment is never seen too well, preferring to slink amongst the shadows, almost seeming to be afraid or annoyed by light. For example, when a phone light flashes on him, he backs away from it and quickly rushes out of the room. It is humanoid in size and stature, with a grayish hue to its skin, also covered in a sort of slime. Its head is much more demonic in appearance, with cavernous eyes, 
odd nose, and no ears, along with very long clawed fingers. We don't know its origins or how it got to the apartment in the first place, but it seems to be driven only to kill anyone that happens to be in its path. There's also an element of putting its selected victims into a kind of trance by staring at them, able to see them even through walls. First glimpse when Sam enters the apartment and stops in her tracks before the monster attacks her, and later with the next door neighbor Leah, who says she can feel something watching her through the walls, and stared blankly in that direction for an indeterminate amount of time. It does seem to feed on its first victim, Sam, found by her friend being munched on by the thing. But when Lindsay is killed later, her body is still mostly intact, only a few bloody marks on it, leading me to believe it's more interested in killing than eating, or perhaps it was just full after feasting on Sam first. Even though we don't know where it came from, interestingly, there are a group of people that seem to be tracking the creature. As soon after Lindsay is killed, a group of three people in night vision goggles arrive to the scene, removing her body from the car and videotaping the whole thing. I initially considered that they were responsible for the creature, and that could be the case. But it does look like they are actually here to help, rushing next door when the monster moves there, killing Leah. And Sean tries to unlock the door to let them in, but trips on a lamp, getting attacked by the monster before they can get inside. And that's the end of the story so far. So we don't quite know what would have happened next, or what the goggled trio intended to do once they got inside. But it makes the most sense to me that they are at least aware of the creature, which leads me to believe it's been popping up at various locations in the area, leaving a trail of bodies in its wake. And the three are trying to track it and hunt it, interested in every detail of its behavior, including how it dispatches its victims. Perhaps in a potential chapter three of the show, we will learn more about how these people fit into the monster story. Another in the Crypt Fable series, the monster design of Mira is absolutely disgusting and amazing, with odd scars all over her face and small glowing eyes. Just unsettling looking. She seems to be a malevolent spirit trapped within a mirror. Our world on one side and a dark void of her collected victims on the other. I think it's not this specific mirror, but any mirror that she can be seen in. A young woman staying at a room in downtown LA becomes her next victim, sitting down in front of a mirror to do her makeup. And suddenly her reflection in the mirror becomes twisted, her face stitched together resembling Mira's. An arm reaches out from the mirror, dragging her into the other side, joining a pile of bodies that are strewn around the area. Trapped on the other side of the mirror, Mira has taken her place in our realm, sitting as the girl's boyfriend comes downstairs unaware of what happened. Mira places a blanket over her head to hide herself, until revealing herself to the boy, her head opening up along the stitches into a huge wide opening, biting his neck painfully and tossing him to the floor. She then begins to make odd clicking noises, as inside the mirror the other bodies, all faceless, rise around the girl, indicating she's not going to be getting back home, and most likely becomes another of the faceless horde in the black void. Since the rules of Mira aren't really established, it seems that she doesn't have to go back into the mirror now that the girl has taken her place, and can continue to kill in our realm. Fun! Stoneheart's monster is a witch called a pony, who is described as a protector of women, which appears to be her main purpose. A pony spirit is attached to a statue that houses her, which based on the details described, is connected to the Salem witch trials that took place in New England in the 1600s. But a pony at least is a real witch, who has been around for hundreds of years, though at first seems dormant until blood is spilled onto the statue, causing it to come to life, defending a woman who is being harassed by a man, the statue bludgeoning him to death to save her. Though we see there is much more to her powers beyond this, when later a young girl, also suffering from abuse, is brought to the statue by a woman who has been looking for the right person to pass it on to, selecting her as she knows her father is abusive. Rebecca places her hand on the statue's face, revealing flashes of her father beating her, along with a female voice saying it will give her all of the power, telling Rebecca Rebecca to come to her. By accepting the witch's offer, Rebecca now has a pony's strengths and powers at her disposal. First seen when fighting back against a boy who is constantly harassing her, a pony appearing and shoving an arm down his throat. But it's revealed that it was in fact Rebecca's arm responsible, with a pony spirit literally working through her body giving her supernatural strength. With her newfound abilities, Rebecca's next target is obvious, her father, showing us she has quickly adapted to her new powers. First finding her father in his police car, luring him into a warehouse, showing him a scene of her being abused, before he follows after her to another room, seeing a four-pointed symbol on the ground. A pony now standing behind Rebecca before she attacks her father. A pony squeezing her hands, giving Rebecca more strength to literally rip her dad's throat out with her bare hands. With her 
their personal justice taken care of, I would imagine that Rebecca takes up the mantle of a pony going forward, of protecting women abused in the world by aggressively taking out their oppressors, continuing the legacy of the witch that began hundreds of years ago, reborn in a sense through a pony physically connecting with Rebecca. In this short, we meet Mordio, an antlered skull-faced monster that appears tied to the woods in which the short takes place. We see a man consuming the flesh of another. Most likely these are hikers that got lost in the very wrong woods, forcing the man into a desperate position to ensure his own survival. But as he learns in these woods, the consuming of flesh comes with a price. When the dead guy is reanimated by the Mordio, speaking through his body, telling him there's no shame in his hunger. Though, now he belongs to the Mordio. Antlers start to form from the top of his head, followed by his skin's flesh falling off, now skeletal with twisted teeth. His transformation complete, the newly formed creature howls out, accompanied by the Mordio's voice informing him it's time for the blood hunt. While we don't learn much else about the creature, the Mordio is quite similar to the Wendigo of folklore. Those creatures were once humans that transformed into the Wendigo after indulging in cannibalism, just as seen here. The end result being that by the hiker consuming the other man's flesh, he too becomes one of the creatures. Now with an unquenchable hunger for the flesh that doomed him to this monstrous fate in the first place. In the silent one please, our monster is the somewhat relatively normal looking ice cream man that rolls into a neighborhood coming across a little girl. But since it's played by Michael Berryman who has been terrifying us in horror movies for decades like The Hills Have Eyes, this ice cream man ain't exactly innocent. And it appears at first that something bad is going to happen to the girl. The creepy truck stalking her and she quickly runs inside. But that's not the case. She just wants an ice cream, tugging at her mother's skirt and giving her the old puppy dog eyes. Without any hesitation, mom first removes a ribbon from her daughter's hair, tying it around her finger to act as a tourniquet, seeing that she's already missing a finger, and her dad is missing too, then proceeds to sever her own finger with a kitchen knife, handing it over to her daughter. Taking the finger, she approaches the ice cream truck, whose side door mysteriously opens, revealing darkness inside. The ice cream man steps forward, the girl showing him the finger, which he looks quite pleased with. He places the finger into a jar with several others, seeing he has quite a collection of parts in his truck, handing her a popsicle in return, which I have to say seems like a pretty steep price for ice cream. Should at least get two rocket pops for a finger, jeez. The man making odd groaning noises as the door closes and the truck dries off to collect more pieces. In the final scene, seeing another girl coming in and tugging at her mother's dress. Then later showing her in line with several other children at the truck all clutching their own fingers to trade for sweet desserts. So who is this mysterious ice cream man and what the heck does he want these fingers and stuff for? I honestly have no idea. But this world seems perfectly okay with the concept of giving up appendages in trade for ice cream. So the ice cream man's presence is something that is common to the people here, since no one raises an eyebrow over his appearance. It's just like, ah, oh, the ice cream man is here. Time to ask my parents for their fingers. But what happens when they run out of fingers? No more ice cream, I guess. I would have to say based on the weird noise the ice cream man makes that he is definitely not human, but some kind of demon that collects the body parts of anyone willing to give them up. And to me, the real concept of the short is less about the backstory of the ice cream man or who he is, but more about the concept that parents will sacrifice anything for their children's happiness. The girl's mom never hesitates when giving up her finger for her daughter, something that any parent can relate to, as they are willing to do anything they can to provide for their children. In this case, it's just much more extreme than normal, an actual physical sacrifice for a simple treat, which it seems all the parents in town are more than willing to do. With that, we have come to the conclusion of our in-depth explanation of some of the biggest and baddest in the cavalcade of monsters that inhabit the Crypt TV universe. But there are a few more that must be mentioned. The eyeless look-see creature that haunts people with unfinished grief, and the very human Taylor, who is also an up-and-coming cult leader with a taste for murder in Sunny Family Cult. For more on these two villains, check out my previous videos covering their series linked in the end card. Also, don't don't forget to subscribe to Crib TV so you don't miss out on great horror videos like those we've talked about today, and of course plenty of new ones. They've got videos going up three times a week, and you don't want to miss those. Which monster sounds the most interesting to you, and which seems the scariest? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.